Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. I see a lot of uh, friends, colleagues, students, which is really wonderful. So thank you all for coming out tonight. I think we've got a really fine presentation and performance for you. Um, before we begin, uh, what I'd like to do is talk to you briefly about uh, what a requiem is. Most of us are, um, are aware that a requiem is somehow related to a funeral. Um, but it is not necessarily a funeral mass or music for a funeral. It is a separate ritual. Most people only have one funeral, but a requiem can be played over and over and over again. And in the 18th century and prior to this, uh, wealthy people paid to have requiems for their loved ones performed on a yearly basis. It's actually how this piece came into being, as we'll, we'll explore in just a little bit. Um, but more than just a piece of music, for someone in the 18th century, especially for a Catholic in the 18th century, um, this was a plea for salvation. It's a petition, in a sense. Um, and you're going to hear a lot of that tonight. And this one is a very special uh, requiem because of, of who wrote it, obviously, but more importantly because of the condition he was in when he was writing it. Um, a requiem, in this sense, is a way of expressing fear of death, but also expressing the hope for eternal salvation and asking uh, in a very personal way uh, for this. People were very frightened at the prospect of death without salvation, and you'll hear that especially when we play and sing the Dies Irae for you. Um, but this piece is very special because it's Mozart's and it's incredibly personal. Mozart died while writing this toward the end of his life. He was aware that he was uh, dying. It, it, he didn't he had, we have notes from the people who were with him on the last six or seven days of his life, and he was aware that he wasn't going to make it. And in a way, we have Mozart's fear of death, his thoughts of death, as he was approaching it, frozen in sound. Um, and that's a very unusual situation for someone as good as, as a Mozart, and we're, we're very fortunate in that way to have it. Um, you'll hear a range of emotions um, in this work tonight. The basic flow comes from fear and penitence to hopefulness, the hope of salvation at the end. Uh, by the end of the work, you need to be convinced that the soul will survive. And Mozart does this really very, very well. Um, most people associate Mozart with symphonies, uh, but Mozart wasn't really a symphonist. That's something he sort of did on the side, if you can believe that. He was a dramatist. Opera was his big thing. And, and so he's very familiar with drama and theatricality, and you'll hear a lot of that in the music tonight, and we'll, we'll do our best to sort of explain this to you and show you this piece by piece and part by part. This event is an experiment. We've never done anything like this. I don't, I've never been to a concert like this, so Bear with us. Uh, this is something quite new for us, and I, I hope that you will really enjoy it here. Um, finally, the context in which we're doing it versus the context in where these would actually be played. This is not a church, obviously. There is no coffin here. Um, and we are not 18th century people. We have different expectations when we come to hear music, and we have to be aware that we'll never be able to reproduce what an 18th century person would have expected, but we can try to understand what that was. Um, in the context, the music you're going to hear, even if you do go to a concert and hear the whole thing, that's never how it was intended to be played. This music was part of a much longer and larger ritual, and sometimes there would be as much as 20 minutes between movements of prayer and chant and processing around the, the church. Um, so do keep that in mind. If you look around your room, you see your friends are here, um, there's no black drapery, no one's died, and you would have experienced this piece and all requiems in a place where someone that you knew and cared about died, and they would have been there with you. And I think that has a very big effect on how one would perceive uh, this music. So we're going to do our best tonight uh, to convey all of this, to hope, you, hope that you have an aesthetic experience, uh, one that brings you fully into life. We definitely do singing it. It is a, it is a joy to perform this work. It's, it's a lot of fun. We really enjoy it. And we hope to bring that to you. I walk around campus all the time. I was noticing it today, and all I see is... Oh, it's the opposite of aesthetic. It's, it's anesthetic. It really is. It is dulling and, and dampering. And we're hoping to do something different tonight. And I think we've done a, a very good job. Um, without further ado, I'd like to start by playing the introit for us, the very beginning of this work here. 
after we tune up a little bit. Above you will be a few things, because we're going to talk about the work and pull it apart a little bit. So we're just going to give you a little bit to look at, show you what sections we're dealing with. So then when we actually pull it apart, you have uh, something to, uh, to glum on to. Would you give us a concert day?
Thank you. Thank you. So what I want to do is sort of talk to you about the timeline of, of the work here. February 14th, Valentine's Day in 1791, Anna Countess von Velsag dies. She's 20 years old. Sometime in mid-July of 1791, her husband, her widower, I suppose, um, anonymously commissions the Requiem for Mozart. This was intended to be for his wife. He was 28, I think. They were a relatively young couple. And the anonymous part is really important because he didn't want Mozart to know who was commissioning the work. August 25th, Mozart leaves Vienna for Prague with Sussmeyer. This is an important name in connection with the Requiem. Sussmeyer is Mozart's student, um, a, a fellow composer. Not nearly of the quality of Mozart, but, but not bad. This is sort of his understudy. And Mozart took him uh, as a copyist to all these places. He was going to Vienna, uh, Prague, pardon me, to um, premiere his second to last opera, the Clemenza da Tito, which is a, a sort of an old-fashioned opera seria. September 30th, 1791, we know that Mozart's back in Vienna because his last opera, The Magic Flute, premieres then. On November 20th, 1791, we know that Mozart takes to his bed, his deathbed. He'll never leave it again. On December 5th, 1791, at five minutes after one o'clock in the morning, Mozart dies. So whatever happened then, whatever happened, whatever ink he put on paper, that was the last of it. We're pretty sure we know where he ended. But that's not where the story ends. On December 10, 1791, we think, we're pretty sure that what you just heard was performed at St. Michael's Church in Vienna uh, for Mozart's Requiem himself. Only this and maybe one other part were ready uh, that were fully fleshed out and could be performed. So it wasn't much of it, but the, the work you just heard, the intro, uh, was performed. And we know that in 1792, his student finishes the score. When Mozart died, his wife was in a pretty bad financial state and they needed the money. They got half of it up front and the other half would have been when the Requiem was finished. So it came to Sussmeyer to finish the score. And Sussmeyer finished the score. He was chosen to finish the score because his handwriting was most closely uh, resembled Mozart's. They were trying to get this to whomever wanted it. They didn't know who it was. And they wanted him to think that Mozart had finished it before they died, before he died. That was important. So we have a, an effort to sort of cover up any indication about where Mozart left off in the student beginning. That's going to make things very complicated for us, trying to figure out what's Mozart's and what's not. This is where it gets interesting. On December 14th in 1792, and on the anniversary of his wife's death, he performs the full Requiem. But he does it in a very strange way. He seems to have gotten the score and copied another one in his own handwriting and then told everyone that it was his work. It's a very odd thing to do to ask God for a favor while you're, <laughs> for your favor for a loved one while you're, you're pulling something like this. This seemed to be something that Valsag had a reputation for. He liked to dress up in other composers' plumage, if you will. He would commission scores, copy them in his own handwriting, and then try to impress his friends by saying that it was his. Um, if you've seen the film Amadeus, this is where Peter Schaefer got that dramatic line about Salieri trying to get a requiem and then kill Mozart for it. So there is a lot of truth to that, to that one story. In 1825, things begin to change. There's an article published, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the German. Um, and in it, Gottfried Weber says that this work is not Mozart's, that we should remove it from the canon, that it could not possibly be his. And the public opinion is beginning to turn on Mozart and to turn on the Requiem. And that's going to create a problem for the people that surrounded him. On November 11th in 1827, Count Velsag dies. And this is important because after he dies, he donates all of his papers to a local library. Um, and in that, in his stack of papers is the original score, the one with Mozart's handwriting. It was lost for the, the previous 28 years. And that's gonna, that will play a, a big deal in determining what's Mozart's and what's not, because we can assess the handwriting. The original score is discovered. There's a, a clip of it. You can see that's his handwriting. And on March 6th, 1842, Constanza Mozart, Mozart's widow, dies. We think the person in the left-hand corner of this might be a photograph of her. This might be Mozart's widow. We're not sure. This is the entire Requiem. We've got Maltese crosses next to the four movements that we're going to perform for you tonight and dig apart. And next to it, I've, I've listed in percentages how much of the ink on the paper is Mozart's and how much of it is not. 
We've played the introit, which is almost entirely Mozart's. We'll play the DSE right next, which is mostly Mozart's. All the voice parts are done, and that's really the, the nucleus of this work. The Lacrimosa, only the first eight measures are Mozart's, and then the rest must be Sussmeyer's. And then there's the Sanctus at the bottom, which has no Mozartian connection at all. Or so most scholars had thought until recently. But if we actually dig through it, there might be some truth to the fact what, what Sussmeyer would, was telling publishers during his lifetime was that Mozart told me what to do. He couldn't write, but he was giving me verbal instruction. And most people in the mid-1800s thought, well, they're just trying to cover it up. They want to protect the reputation of this piece. And they indeed were interested in protecting the reputation of this piece because this piece became known as Mozart's crowning achievement. This represented his entire musical life to most people. So the people that surrounded Mozart did have an interest in protecting it. But we'll take a look at the Sanctus, and there are some clues that Mozart might have given an indication to Sussmeyer, and we can find the evidence in there. It's, uh, it, you gotta dig, but it's there, and it's really fascinating, I think. These are some of the, uh, some of the, the writings about Mozart's Requiem toward the middle of the 18th century. Um, so it was very important for Constanza, for the people that surrounded Mozart, to really try to push this back, to protect this, if not Mozart's complete work, that spiritually this belonged to him, that this is, in essence, Mozartian. Okay, so what can we actually see when we dig in the introit? Well, the entire Requiem, or at least everything that Mozart wrote, is connected by a very short theme. Would you play? It's just a five-note theme. I'm going to ask the choir to sing after this on Na. Ready? Choir. And. That's it. That is the, ner the germ of this piece. That is the nucleus of this piece. Now, I'd like to hear the woodwinds, please, those that come in the beginning. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask them to play their introduction. And they're going to play um, the first couple notes that they play. And we're going we're to do this in time right from the beginning, um, so right on beat two. And even if you don't read music, um, that's fine. Uh, we were going to have, every time you see this pattern appear, that will indicate another entrance of this theme. So he takes this theme and then he begins to layer it. Um, let's hear. And so this is how this whole thing is. You'll hear this, and he does this every time this theme comes in in this way. It layers on top of itself. If we listen to when the voices actually come in, we'll hear that as well. Can I have the voices, please? This is your measure eight. And so you can hear that this is, all, this is going to infect everything that happens. And in the intro, it's most obvious. It, it's, it's very, very clear that how this is going to use. But this is, you'll see that the incredible economy that Mozart's able to achieve by using this. There's a lot of variety in this, but if we actually dig deeper, it's all related to just these five notes here. Now, what's Handel have to do with this? Um, George Friedrich Handel was sort of the opposite of Mozart in a way. Very successful, had a royal appointment, tons of money, very famous. Uh, also a much earlier uh, version, a much earlier, uh, not a contemporary of Mozart, he dies in 1759, but very, very famous. And we know that Mozart made an arrangement of this funeral anthem, The Ways of Zion Do Mourn. And 
we know that Mozart was aware of this, and if we listen to the beginning of the Mozart Requiem, and then we listen to the beginning of Handel's work, we're going to see that they're awfully similar. call that borrowing. Um, but he's, he's not lifting it. This is, it, it's a musical signal. This puts Mozart's work into context, into a funereal context, into an ecclesiastical context. Handel seems to have been aware of this from Bach. It's a Bach, it's the beginning of a Bach chorale, also on the topic of death. So this motive, this five note motive, seems to have a long history of being associated with funereal music, something of the kind. Um, and we see that Mozart obviously was aware of this piece. We know because we have his handwriting, he wrote this piece out. So he must have had this sort of in the back of his head. And that is, I think, where he may have understood that this is the motive he wants to build uh, his piece on. It's not an unusual thing for a composer to do that here. Um, now, what I'd like to do, this is the beginning. Uh, the text is small, but this is also in your program, so you probably had time to look at it. It's not a very full program. The text of the antiphon uh, reads, Requiem eternam dona eis domine. And then the second line of the antiphon is, Et lux perpetua lut seat eis. Grant them eternal rest, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. Um, this is my Catholic school upbringing finally coming in handy. Um, and what you'll see is, while this is very emotional and, and really much more Dionysian than Apollonian, um, what you'll notice is that Mozart is very careful in creating structure and, and really careful about how he uses words and how he uses different phrases. For instance, the first line of this, Requiem Eternam Dona Eis, is always staggered. You'll never hear the choir saying that the, all four parts will never say the same words at the same time. On the other hand, Et Lux Perpetua is always going to be said at the same time, or sung, I should say, at the same time. Right, so the requiem will be staggered, and then when we get to at lux perpetua, that's always going to be in unison. And what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to sing through some of this, but we're going to do it on staccato, so you can hear all the accents, and you can hear all the placement of the text. And you can see how Mozart really does a very fine job of sort of staggering it. So this is uh, voices and, uh, and horns. This is from measure eight, please, staccato. Um, and can I add the bases in here too? Just the beginning is the notes. Boom. Okay. Uh. Thank you. 
when we get to et lux perpetua, everything finally comes together. And it's important because the text is, that is now asking something. You're, you're, you're petitioning God directly here. And so it's important, it's very dramatic that finally all the, voice, all the, the forces are mounted to make this as clear as possible. Can I hear everyone, please, et lux perpetua, this is going to be measure 15, measure 15. Also, notice when he finally gets to the word luceat, which translates as shine, how, what a wonderful moment that is. We, we've been leading up to that word for the entire introit. Measure 15. Yes. The second section is a psalm tone. And this sounds very, very different in context. We change from a minor key to a major key. It sounds really very different. But what we'll notice is that it is intimately connected to what we've just heard, to this theme here. Would you play the Requiem theme again? 20. So what Mozart does is he takes that theme, theme pardon me, and he turns it upside down. Um, so he takes that and he just turns it up. So this sunny second theme is, is just the first theme turned upside down and then he'll, he'll stagger it three times in a row. Can I hear the first clarinet? Did you play measure 20? Um, ready? And... And so that's what the entire middle section, the, the, the psalm tone, is completely built around, this sunny section. Now, if we actually listen to what's going on in the, in the orchestration, it, on, on paper, it's, it's quite complicated. But what we notice when we look at that, now for you that don't read me, that's just, it doesn't look like anything. But what we've done, we wanted to show you that the entirety of this orchestration is anything, it's only the inversion of it or its original form. Everything is that five note motive. It's incredibly economical. Can I hear all of the wind players, please, right at measure 20? We'll play through some of this section. And Anna, would you please come out so we get ready here? Actually, Anna, we're going to add you right away. Anna's part is a psalm tone. You notice that all, in the first section, the voices have all of this complexity. Now they're out, and Anna's the only one that's going to sing, and it's a very simple melody. It's flat. It doesn't move very much. It's very static. All the complexity then moves in to the orchestra. Uh, this is how a psalm would be sung. Psalms are probably the oldest living musical tradition in the Western world. So here we go, the B section. 20, everyone. Anna Eisbach, everyone. That's our soloist tonight. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Anna sings the first half of this. Te decet hymnus et zion et tibi This is right out of the book of Psalms. This is biblical text. Most of the text in the Requiem is not biblical. This is really the only section. Most of this is poetic, sacred, but poetic text. Now, when the voices come in, they sing something very different. The first one is literally the prayer, and then the second section where we have underlined is a petition, hear us. And any time the text seems to ask directly from God, et lux perpetua, or hear my prayer, what you get is a very dramatic moment. And so uh, Mozart has 
the three quarters of the choir, from the altos all the way down to the basses, they are just singing exaudi, exaudi, hear us, hear us, hear us. And then the soprano section will now sing what you've just heard, anising. They will sing the prayer. So they're asking you to hear, and the sopranos are literally lifting the prayer up above everyone. So can I hear um, everybody, please, at measure 26. Measure 26. dramatic moment there. And Mozart is very good at this, and it's, it's always really based on the text. Um, keep in mind that Mozart has no control over the text. The text of a Catholic Rexwium is fixed. It cannot change. You only have an option to decide how you want to set it. So Mozart's not creating any of the text. That's given to him. And he does, I think, a really remarkable job with this. Now we return to the A section, to the antiphon again, and this is when things get complicated because we spot the first section hearing the Requiem theme. <laughs> and the B section hearing its inversion. And in the, a, the return of the A section, we're now going to use these together, lock them into counterpoint. And this gets very, very complicated. So basses, can I hear you please at measure, what are we, 36? 34. Basses at measure 34, and they're going to sing the Requiem theme. Here we go. Ready? <sighs> Good. Altos are now going to have the inversion. Can I hear that? Would you give me uh, the, the A, please? And now they lock and they work as a single unit together. Can I hear the basses and the altos, please, from the downbeat or from beat two of measure 34? So that makes a single musical unit. And then the two voices that have not sung are going to sing that same collection as another unit. We're getting extremely complicated here. We're going to have the tenors now sing the same Requiem theme. Can I hear the tenors, please, starting on your A? <coughs> And then the sopranos will sing our inversion. Can I get a E? Good. So this is really difficult to put together because it's incredibly complicated. So let me hear just the voices, please, um, and the corresponding horns from that spot here. This is from measure 34, beat 2. I don't know really how to stop that. Once it gets going, it really has to finish, but we're doing our best here. So you can see that the variety that you're hearing is, is really just based on those five notes. It's really quite economical. This is probably my favorite section of the whole part. So what we have here is the two middle voices are now going to 
have each of them are going to have their own independent line, but they only work well with another completely independent line. It's imagine, think of your four favorite pop songs right now, and you have to write a tune where each one of those songs would work with, they could be layered on top of the other one and create a perfect harmony. It's a very difficult thing to do, and we'll see when we get to the end of the Requiem why Sussmeyer had to back away from some of the things Mozart wanted him to do, because this is just too hard. Um, but it's Mozart, and he could do this, and he didn't really even have to like work. There's no sketches. He just sort of <laughs> and wrote it down. Um, so we, we don't know how Mozart worked because we have no record. He doesn't leave a sketchbook. Beethoven has reams of paper where he just scratches stuff out. No, this doesn't work. Mozart just wrote. Um, it's it's really astounding. All right, can I hear? Uh, this is going to be um, the tenors. We are at measure 40 on beat. Three, right? In the C. Here we go. <laughs> Good. Notice that the tenor line goes up. Now we're going to hear the alto. They're going to have th the corresponding line, the one that fits with theirs. Theirs are going to head down. So we actually have, by the end of each little phrase, the tenors are singing above the altos. Um, so he takes, uh, essentially, it, it's the texture. He takes it starting here, and he, he whittles it down to nothing in the middle voices. So if you imagine sitting at a piano, your hands would start here, and by the end of this, they would be almost on top of each other. How, why he does this, the effect, what he, when you see what he does with the outside voices, the soprano and the bass, it's a really nice moment. Altos, can I hear your line? Good. Can we add the, the tenors now? We're going to play with them. So let's we'll put these two lines together and see how it sounds here, the, the nice harmony. Um, just to see, yeah? So it'll be, I'll just give you, um, mm, mm, okay? Again. Good. Now, we're going to have this lined up. We'll take the basses and the sopranos. This contracts, as we can see. And then we'll hear the basses are going to have the inversion, everything we've already heard before. Can I hear the basses? Please, tell us, would you sing? No, you're fine. Just the basses and bass drum bone and the lower strings. This is measure 40. Okay. I'm going to give you one. We're starting on the end of 40. One. And da, da, da. Got it? Here we go. And. <sighs> Good. And you notice that that line also descends. But then we have the sopranos who have, they have the theme, the requiem theme, the five note theme. Can you give me the high F? I'm sorry about the sopranos. This is an awful place for them to start. It's very high. Ready? Done. Thank you. That's not easy to do. So when we put this all together, you can see it's the texture that really makes this moment. The inner voices contract to where they're almost in unison, but the outer voices really expand. So that we send the, the sopranos into the stratosphere. I think that's the highest note in the whole work. Uh, I don't think there's a, anything above an A. There might be a B flat in the Kyrie, but that's, that's nothing. Um, and we send the basses down. So we have the playing with texture. It's a really, really nice moment. Can I hear everyone, please, on the downbeat of measure 40. That's, a, that's really, it's probably my favorite moment in the whole thing. And, and he does this um, 
really just, you've heard this already. It, 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 he links all of this psychologically. This five-note theme, you, you know it by now. You may not be aware of this consciously, but it's certainly part of the DNA of this work by now. We're about three and a half, four minutes into it, and we know it here. So, now that we know a little bit about it, um, we're going to play the entire thing for you again. I'll have some of the slides up as we go, I hope, um, as we get to the parts to remind you about what is you here. Maybe we can all put it together in context. So now we're going to do um, the second go at the intro from the beginning all the way through, and I won't talk and interrupt. So here we go.
Now we get to the fun stuff. Um, the DSC of A is a very, it's just it's called a sequence. Now the Catholic Church had lots and lots and lots of these up until the point. And then a Vatican Council came through and cut all but four. This is one of the ones that made it. It's a poem. And this poem is very, very famous and it's always said the music and it's specific to what record we have. Um, and it's the imagery in, in this poetry is, is very stark. I hope that's my next slide. It is. Okay. And you've also been reading this. Uh, Day of Wrath, and Day of Lizano Nash, he says, we're told by you. This is fire and brimstone stuff. And uh, Mozart is very good at setting this. This is really frightening. Here we can see at the beginning of the sequence versus the end, which is a lot of those which we'll do last. You really see a progression from fear toward hope of salvation. But this is definitely the section for fear. So um, we'll play it for you, and then, and then we'll take it away. So here we go. It's a lot of fun. We really enjoy it, especially the choir. They just get to bark. It's a really, it's a really, and they, stand, they have a great sound. What do you hear them by themselves here? Um, we know that Mozart wrote this. We know that Mozart wrote, um, the question of, uh, did he write this? We know we have his ink, and there's some clues in here, some things we want to take a look at. Uh, this is the the page of the first score, and what we're going to do is we're going to isolate, this is working now, thank you, uh, we're going to isolate just the choral part. So let's hear just the choir alone uh, for the first eight measures. Can you roll the chord, please? You're lying. Of course, it sounds completely different than our first movement. It's, it's, in, it, it's in no way related, we don't think. But if we actually take a look at this, we can see that it's buried in here. Sopranos, would you please sing your part here? If you take a look at the text that I have in box, Sovlet Seclum in Favila, would you please sing that? Give me a D. I'll give you one, two, three, coming on four, okay? One, two, three. Sovlet Seclum in Favila. Good, and now what we're going to do is just take out the remaining 
that's, oh, that's where we should have been. So we'll X out any of the notes that are repeated. And will you just sing on na for me? It's just going to be easy. It's there. It's, it's already in there. He's buried it in there, but it's there. It's, it's almost incomprehensible how quickly it would float over your head, but it's there. The idea is that psychologically, or what we would now call psychoacoustically, that it binds this thing together, that it makes it somehow relatable to the first movement. Now, that's not the only place in these eight measures where it's buried. Let's take a look at the bass part. Basses, can you play from measure? Now, in there, that's all. <laughs> so in there, we have the same thing. We're going to take, take this and any repeated notes, we're going to get rid of them, X them out, and we're going to see that in there is the theme. Give me the D, we'll just go on na. All in the first eight measures, and it all goes by lightning quick, but it's there. And in some way, you do get it. It's, it's what puts this together. This is very different, obviously, in terms of its style, in terms of its mood, in terms of the atmosphere. But it is still somehow linked and somehow has a kind of connectivity. This is the connective tissue that puts all this together. Um, in the middle of this, we have this section. Um, can I hear? This is going to be Sopranos. Would you please sing from... Measure 10. Would you give me an F? So follow along with the soprano. If you don't read music, just follow the words. Good. Can I hear the tenors, please, at measure 11? Would you give me their, their F? Can I hear the sopranos and the tenors, please, from measure 10? Sopranos and the tenors. And a C, please, Alan. So you can listen for that as we go along. He, he still, even in something like the DSC array, it's very, he still wants to weave in counterpoint. One line facing another, a point of, chasing another, pardon me, a point of imitation. It's, he's very good at it, and you don't even notice it's there. That's how good it is. This is just a lot of fun. Um, the text read, when the tremors come. Um, and Mozart does a really good job of actually making the tremors. This is what, Bedra 40? Can I hear the tenors and basses? Just play the, just the first one. And the whole section is devoted to that. There's a whole section where he just takes a play on the word tremors and builds an entire thing out of it. Can I hear all the voices, please, from measure 40? The whole section is just based on this idea of tremors, and he, he's very careful to do this. He'll pick something from the text. These are words that are evocative of this section of the DS here, right? So he, he wants to be at his best when it calls for high drama, and Mozart can do this sort of better than anyone else, I think, at least within the context of an 18th century composer. Finally, I don't think there's one more thing. Ah, yes, the very end here. Um, uh, voices, we're going to be starting at measure 57. 
This is measure 57. Now he'll take the choir and he'll split it up. The women against the men and then everything together in what we call paired imitation. One line um, over here in the, in the women's voices. Can I hear the women play uh, just sing Kung Kastrikte? I'll give you one. Kung And then the men will follow it. And then he'll line them all up together. And, and this is sort of the, the, this is the architecture which he uses toward the end of this piece. Two against two, all together. Two against two, all together. Can I get all the voices, please? Would you please um, sing from 57 all the way to wherever? <laughs> one. And one. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a lot of fun. So this back and forth, the choir singing all together, but the real fire is, is in the instruments here. Can I hear all the instruments, please, from 57? No trombone or horn. All the instruments from 57. This sort of fire and brimstone. You can see, even if you don't read music, the, the lower lines go up, the top lines go down at a very fast pace. Um, Carlos, could you play yours just by yourself? Thanks. <laughs> this is, a, I think, good a time as any. Every note that comes out of this instrumental ensemble tonight, obviously this is not an orchestra. We've had to rearrange it for financial reasons. Um, <laughs> and uh, because we, we wanted to do this quickly, um, Carlos arranged every piece, and he spent hours and hours doing it. So please give him Woo! another round of applause. Stand up. Stand up. Really nicely done. <clears throat> and I think the arrangement works very well. It really does. This is, it, it doesn't sound out of place at all. Instruments, measure 57. So here's some of the fire and brimstone. Oh, trumpet and drums, you can really go on. 57. Well, let's put that all together so you can see that Mozart's very, he's very smart about this. When something is very active or something is very urgent, he, he clears the other thing out. So you notice the voices are relatively, although they're loud and they're forceful, it's relatively easy to follow. They're not, they're not doing complex counterpoint. So let's put all this together here. This is everybody at downbeat of measure 57. Downbeat of 57. Yeah, go ahead and give us some pitches. We just wanted to, a part of what tonight was is, um, a big part of what tonight was, the idea was that um, I listen to this kind of music all the time. Ask any of my friends that are in the room and how often they will avoid a car ride with me because of this. By the way, it saves you a lot of gas money. Um, and I often wonder when I play this, what is it that people find so inaccessible that I just, at best, I'll get an eye roll. If not, they'll just take control of my, my car stereo. Um, so what is it that people find um, that they cannot access this? And I think because we talk about this up here, we're in rehearsal. We get to hear the architecture constructed layer by layer by layer by layer. You can't hear that, I don't think, when you're just having 40 minutes of really fine composition wash over you, uh, note after note after note after note after note. Um, in the 11th, I, I, 
I actually counted the amount of notes in the DSC array today in one of the parts. And a rough estimate of the three or the four pieces we're doing tonight, the amount of notes that are in it, each one of them being a discrete pitch event, versus the, and you multiply that by the amount of people doing it, in the 11 minutes, there are 100,000 discrete pitch events that occur on the stage tonight. Um, that's a lot to take in at one sitting. So I think the goal of this was that when you listen to this again more often and then you get some sort of w way into it that you might find it more enjoyable, that you might know what to listen for or you might find something, not, not that we're pointing you to listen to this, but that you might find something you can latch on to. There's a lot going on here and it happens very, very quickly and I think this might be one way to make it more accessible. So we're going to play the entirety of the DS here again and I will try to align my slides with the ones you've just heard so you can sort of zero into what we're doing. From the top again, everyone. Now we come to, we're going to go a little out of order, we're going to look at one that has no association with Mozart whatsoever. This is the Sanctus. It's also different in that it's the only major keyed piece we're going to play tonight. This is in D major, not in D minor. Um, it's going to have an effect on, on, on how Sus, um, um, Susmeyer, we have a different picture in the corner here, of how Susmeyer treats it. We think that this is all Sussmeyer's. The only ink that we have is in Sussmeyer's hand. Mozart was dead before we have any indication that he began to work on it. Um, so we want to play you just the very beginning, the first ten measures or so of the song too. So go ahead and, and roll our pitches here. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
obviously this is very different in character. It's a major key. This is not part, this is, a song two is just part of any mass. It's part of the ordinary of the mass. And this is not specific to a funeral or to a wedding or to whatever. Every mass has the song twos. Um, and so here, in, when you're not pleading about your own life or your own soul, you are just praising God. Uh, a, a sunnier key, I think, is, is more appropriate. And that's what we get here. Um, <coughs> when we are, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> When we were rehearsing this, we had a lot of trouble putting this together. And in fact, um, our poor horn player has to double the alto line, and it's a mess. Um, because Mozart didn't write it, and while the notes are easy on the page, it doesn't flow. It's not a good melody. It's, it's like a theory one or theory two kid who's not quite understood what he's doing. Um, and there's all of these what we call errors in it. So anyone who looks at this says, this cannot be Mozart. There's no way this is Mozart. And that's probably very true. Um, but we do seem to have an indication that there was some kind of instruction given to Susmar. We've got to look really deeply, but we're going to do this. Can I hear just the choir, please? Would you sing the first? Oh, one, two, three, four, five. First five measures. Up until the plenty two, okay? Up until the first five. This is, this is how we rehearse. <laughs> so just the choir and clarinet three and four bassoons and of course the horns. just the soprano singing. Al, would you play along with us? Can you do that? Just the soprano. This is the soprano melody point you just heard. Ready? Sopranos, go back to the DSC ring. By the way, I have no idea we're about to do this. Go back to the DSC ring, Soprano. And I want you to sing the first eight measures. Give me the first four pitches, because I think our heads might be in a major key. Got it? else not anything alike. But what we do notice is that that boxed in thing is the theme we've showed you. The theme will only occur in a minor keyed work. So that must be eliminated here. So we take out the theme, we get rid of it. And then we notice Mozart's pattern. When he uses a pattern, repeated notes don't count. So we'll X out all the repeated notes here. And now, ladies, would you please go back to the Sanctus and sing the first four bars of the Sanctus. Give me the first four notes. Here we go. First four bars of the song. And watch the correspondences. Just follow the text. Ready? right there. So there's a good indication that maybe Mozart did tell Sussmeyer to do something, because that's not an accident. So there really is probably some truth that Sussmeyer did get verbal instruction from Mozart while he could not write on the last few days of his life. There's no doubt that the majority of this work is, is Sussmeyer's. It's full of things Mozart would never do. It's full of bad inner melodies. 
But that's a clear indication that Mozart wanted him to tie this into the larger work in some way. And he did that by using essentially the same melody from the Dies Irae. Again, it's not obvious, you know, oh, that's the Dies Irae melody, but it feels connected. It's the subtlety. It's what makes Mozart better than all of his contemporaries. It's really interesting stuff. Let's, now we'll sing the entire Sanctus again, and then we'll get on to the Lacrimosa. Here we go, everyone, Sanctus. Good. Nice, it's, it's competent. It's, it's absolutely a competent work. Um, it's, it's just not Mozart. And if we were to go on and, and play the rest of it, you would really kind of feel the wheels come off compositionally. It gets it's this really ugly fugue at the end that, that as we'll, we'll, we'll know, Sosmeyer avoided fugues, avoided in, uh, intense counterpoint. And we have really good evidence for that, that he just didn't want to touch it. Okay, um, now the one that everyone knows and loves, the Lacrimosa. Um, what we see on here, this is the actual autograph manuscript of Mozart's. So, and what we, this is the last eight measures of music he ever wrote. Yes, so that's it. In the, the very upper corner, uh, one of his students, the, very, uh, the, the first page on the top right-hand corner, um, is an indication by one of his students, a guy named Eibler, who also, his handwriting also is somewhere in the Requiem. There's three handwritings in this piece. He wrote at the top that this was Mozart's final, uh, his final ink to paper. So. This is probably, and this was probably, if he died on December 5th, this is probably somewhere around the 3rd or the 4th that he actually had done this. Um, it's a very famous work, and, and the choir sings it beautifully. So we'll play this for you. Um, you've all must have heard this at some point, I think, and then, then we'll dig through just a little bit of it. Here we go, Lacrimosa.
they make a really good sound. <laughs> they really do. So I don't want to spend too much time in, into this because I think we've, we've had enough. So the text you obviously had, this is more of a beatitude. This is the end of the sequence. There's four pieces in between the DS array and here. And we move away from the sort of fire and brimstone to something a little more calm. I think by the end of this, by the end of the sequence, especially in this piece, you do have at least some hope uh, that the soul can live on. And so we've, we've really moved away um, contextually from this. Now, so this is what the score looks like. But I wanted you to, this is what everyone sees. But if we take and only include Mozart's handwriting, this is all we have left. All the rest is Sussmeyer's. Um, now, we don't know what Sussmeyer got from Mozart. We'll never know. We'll never know what he was told. And he didn't go specifically into that. But I want to point out just a couple things of this. Um, can I hear the, the, the instruments? Would you play just the first two measures? You hear this, mm, da, da, mm, and it never goes away. Mm, da, da, mm. This was what they call the, the tear motif. So it sort of, it, it has a kind of lament overtone to it. And we'll see exactly why that is. So here, just the first two measures. What we actually see in here is that there's, it sounds very pretty, but there's an incredibly harsh dissonance. Can I hear um, uh, the saxophones and clarinet twos, would you sustain your, uh, sustain your first pitch? And then I want to bring in clarinet ones and flute, would you sustain your first pitch? So, twos and saxes. You don't notice that as it's going by, but that harsh sound, what I call the fry machine sound. Have you ever been to McDonald's? <laughs> the fry machine goes off and it beeps, and then the next fry machine starts beeping too, and they have it set at that interval, a half step, so that it drives you nuts, <laughs> right? I'm not, that's really why they do that, right? You, you never hear the, you would never walk into a casino and hear slot machines that sounded like that because you'd run away. Um, they're, they're very careful with, with psychoacoustics. So that dissonance is there every, is that me doing that? So that dissonance is there every time, you, it, but you don't really notice it in this context. Um, it sounds like a wrong note, but it's not. A, that's, that quick passing tone is what sort of gives it this, this sad feeling, this, this lament, this sort of mournfulness. It's really nicely done. Um, I don't, the choir doesn't know we're doing this, but choir, would you, um, would you start please um, from your entrance? And what I want to take you notice is this line right here. The, so the sopranos start from a low D and go all the way up to a high A in one line. It's gruesome. It's really, really hard. And we, we know that Mozart, this is the last bit, it's the word resurgence. And this phrase is about resurgence. So you can see in the first eight or nine measures that the first line of text is about resurgence. And he paints this extremely well. It's very moving. And actually, we're only going to play the first eight measures. Everybody will do the first eight measures, and we'll stop after Reus. So we won't go on past that. This is the last thing he ever wrote. So let's listen to the last thing that Mozart ever wrote and see how he really opens up on the word resurgence. It's, it's very dramatic. Again, here we go. From the top, just the first eight measures. That's when he put his pen down forever. That's it. That's the last bit we have it. But again, it's really dramatic. The rest of it is really not Mozart's. It's in Sussmeyer's handwriting. Um, but there are some pretty interesting things that Sussmeyer is able to do. And we think this sort of gives you an idea about, about that he might have had some input. Um, chorus. This is measure 13, Huic Ergo. Um, can I have, uh, would you give the, I need the tenor and the alto pitch. Tenors and altos only with the corresponding horns. This is measure 15, I'm sorry, 15. 
Has everyone got it? Who week ago? doesn't move, right? It doesn't move at all. But if we take a look at the soprano and the bass, can I hear the soprano and the bass from the same spot with the corresponding measure 50? Oh, you don't play? Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're out there. Okay. Measure 50. Do you give that again? Because I'm talking over you. Think this is most sorry, this is something that he did a lot. He took the inner lines and kept them very static, and the outer ones move like in a mirror image. One goes up, one goes up, the other one goes down, and you have this sort of uh, almost like a, a vertical accordion effect happening here. It's really effective. Let's all do that, please. Full chorus and chorus. Oh, you don't play. Full chorus, please, at that moment. Measure 15 all the way to the cadence. I think the biggest clue that is here is in the soprano line. Sopranos, would you please go to measure 26? Um, and would you play along with us, please, Alan? It starts on an E. Here we go. Pardon me? Stop. There's the theme. We're going to start at beat two now. Give me the D. There's the theme. Ready, Sopranos? Does that sound familiar now? It's there. Right? It's buried, but it's there. The big amen, which everyone loves. It seems that Mozart did not intend this piece to end this way. All, there's five large sections of this work, and each one of the five, except for this, ends with a very complicated fugue, lots of counterpoint, really difficult stuff. This one doesn't, and, and that seems odd. But we know that Mozart actually did leave a sketch. Among his papers was a sketch for a fugue on the Amen that was based on an inversion. Da, 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 da. And if we look, and if we realize the sketch, the, essentially the piece of paper that wasn't realized, and we listen to what it sounded like, this is what it, it would have sounded like had it been begun. This is what Mozart wrote, the 16 measures that he left. That's all we have. That's a hell of a lot more complicated than ah, men. Um, and it's a fully realized double fugue. Sussmeyer wanted no part of it. He could, he could not do that. And he knew he couldn't do that. It's really hard to do. Um, but this is sort of a musicologist's fantasy, because then they get to finish the Mozart Requiem this way. And so we have lots of people who have actually finished this Amen in a style that's Mozartian. And I'm going to play one of them for you tonight, a guy named uh, Robert Levin, who is a musicologist at Harvard. Um, and uh, there's a, a few of these out here that they've, they've taken the sketch and realized it out. So this is maybe what it would have sounded like had Mozart finished the Amen. It's short, but it's very complicated, and it's a lot of fun. The theme, the inversion of that theme, we flew out. Regular version. 
And this was Sussmeyer's answer. <laughs> he just couldn't. There's no way. I mean, it really is. It's really hard to do. And you have to understand, Sussmeyer is a capable composer, and he knows the rules, but he's also on a time limit, right? No one wants, just like no one wanted to write the next symphony after Beethoven died, no one wants, and, and to actually stand in for Mozart was, I think, a lot for, for anyone, right? And then to have to do something like this on a time frame, I mean, it was just impossible. The guy really did a superhuman job, I think, tasked with what he did. So there's no reason to dump on him. Um, but this is not how it was intended to end. Um, the thing we know about the Mozart Requiem is that there really is no such thing. There is no finished version. It's not a text that is solid and complete. It's a fragment. And so you can never actually hear the Mozart Requiem. You can hear Mozart Requiems. There are many different editions and finishings of them. And tonight we gave you the Sussmeyer edition, the one that is the most commonly used, the one that at least has some provenance right next to Mozart. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed tonight. Um, I hope you've learned a little bit I, I will say that's secondary. I hope you've in, enjoyed yourselves. I hope you found this to be interesting, and I hope that in some way you can listen to this music a little differently than maybe you did before you walked in tonight. We're very, very happy to perform for you this evening. We're going to end with the Lacrimosa, and then that's really going to be it. Um, uh, when we're done, would you please join us in the atrium of Building 3, which is that way. We have some food, I think, um, and come easy. <laughs> you don't know me. <laughs> don't get between me and food. <laughs> um, um, and come meet our performers. Uh, they, they, they came in yesterday. They worked their butts off. Uh, we've done an incredible job in two days. And uh, I'm so pleased uh, to be standing in front of, of this group, a wonderful group of students and friends that have come in, faculty, staff, professionals. It's a really fun thing to bring us together and do this. This connects us, not our Facebook. This really does bring us together, and it, we really have been alive here. And, um, there's two more people that I, I really need to thank. The first uh, is Alan Gerber. He's a director of choral activities here, and he prepared...